Wiley Aitken was there when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, and over the years, he's carried on the Kennedy tradition in law, politics, and community. Youngest president ever of the California trial bar, winner of multi-million dollar judgments against corporations, advocate for education and the arts, a backer of Democratic candidates from local office to president of the United States. Now he's working to loosen the GOP's grip on Orange County, even as he works with Republican friends on civic matters. Wiley Aiken, a blue giant in red territory. He's next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by... Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live. They are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way health care is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Could you, like, not do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, I'm Rick Reef, and I'm talking with Wiley Aitken. Well, Wiley, it is great to have you uh, on, on this show in particular, because this is the 500th uh, episode of Inside OC, and you were guest number one on the very first show. You and Pat Brennan from The Register, we were talking about mountain lions. Well, I'm flattered to be here on the 500th show, uh, and you look so young, Rick. It's amazing. Um, yes, I do remember the show, and I uh, was honored to be there, too. And uh, uh, the mountain lion, of course, was the Laura Small case that was getting so much exposure when the poor young five-year-old was, uh, was badly mauled. And, and um, it's kind of an example, frankly, of how the law can make things better. In that case, they had these great signs at uh, Casper's Park that mountain lions were quiet, secretive, and had a healthy aversion to humans. Now that didn't happen with that savage attack on uh, Laura Small, and it was uh, indicative that they had no idea about what they were dealing with. Subsequent to that case, and the and the case we tried and won against the county, uh, of course, now no one can go anywhere in the county in any area that's mountain lion territory without seeing clear signs warning them about the potential dangerousness of them, and explain the fact that they're a 150 foot cat. The largest carnivore in the North American con continent. Not quiet, not secretive. <laughs> we haven't, it, back then, and the reason you were on is because there had been a, 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 a several uh, mountain lion encounters and there had been another attack. Uh, not hearing much about that now. Uh, well, there was are we a just dramatic, lucky or what? Well, we're probably a little bit lucky. We also, frankly, we're just driving them out and driving them out and driving them out. I mean, the idea is the reason it happened in the first place is that we were building and reaching out into mountain lion country. They have a wide range of, of areas that they right. cover up to 100 miles. And so what we've done is squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. So to a large degree, we've eliminated the problem in, by eliminating, in, by eliminating their land and yeah. their place to live and the uh, place for them to be. Yeah. So uh, the second thing is, is that people are being more cautious and we've now been better educated. The next dramatic event you may recall, written, it was discussed recently in an article in the register, was the issue of the, the young lady who was attacked uh, when they, a mountain lion actually killed an individual. Mm -hmm. Uh, bicycles, bicyclist, and then they came along and saw a bike that was unattended, then they got attacked. Uh, and they came to me, by the way, uh, to represent and help them. But I said, hey, the law has changed. The law changed because all the warnings and all the criticisms that were appropriate back at the time of Laura Small uh, of course, now has changed, and now the signs are posted. So you're, you're a plaintiff's lawyer who turned down an opportunity to, to sue on that one. Uh, I did, because frankly, the law had done everything we asked it to do, and the government had responded appropriately. And then at some yeah. point, we all recognize, yeah. including trial lawyers, right. that we assume risks in life. So, so and, much so much to talk about, but let's just close the loop here. Okay. How's Laura doing? How old is she now, and how's she doing? God, Laura's in her 30s. She's married. She graduated from Arizona State University. She's working uh, in an area of uh, pet control and uh, no pet service. 
uh, not mountain lions. I don't think she has floating around. Uh, uh, but the reality is uh, the good fortune for Laura, uh, Laura was that she was permanently paralyzed on the right side, uh, but there was no cognitive impairment despite the massive injury to her skull. And that being the case, she was able to go on and get a college so education. She's lived a, uh, she's lived a happy uh, and normal life. I think she's lived a happy and normal life uh, as we define Very it. Good. So let's talk, I mentioned the Kennedy uh, inspiration, but tell us a little bit about your background. You, you are one of the great movers and shakers of Orange County. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know, growing up and how you wound up in the law. Uh, well, it, it's a, I'll try to keep it direct as possible, but frankly, I grew up in the Midwest. I was what you would call a uh, engineer brat. My dad was getting all these consulting jobs at various uh, companies, Boeing, Ford. I was born in Detroit. Um, and then eventually we settled into Wichita, Kansas, because Wichita was where Boeing was at the time before they went to Seattle. That's where the B-52s and the B-47s and all those planes were built. So I was this young kid, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn kid uh, in Wichita, Kansas, uh, up to the just previous to the time that we uh, came to California. And as such, I grew up in a great atmosphere. Uh, I had a great mom who was, uh, I'm definitely a maternal child, uh, not to put my poor deceased dad down, but I will give some kudos to my deceased mom. Uh, who was really focused on myself. We came from a very low-income, modest Catholic family. Uh, she taught me a lot of things, and particularly about generosity and giving uh, and tithing to the church. Uh, one of my favorite mom stories was when I went to one of those fiestas and I cleverly figured out how to win like $42 which was a fortune for, for, for a young sixth or seventh grader. Uh, and then she looked at me and said, what is that? And I said, well, that's the money I won, Mom. He said, you can't win money from the church, so go back and lose it all. So I was then ordered back into the fiesta and lost my $42, because uh, no way was I going to take any money away from the church and leave uh, that uh, fiesta. So Mom taught me early on about giving, about being generous. Uh, and then she always told me, that when I graduate from college, now that was, none of our, my siblings ever had gone to college. We had not had a sibling go to college. Um, and so, but she always told me I was gonna go to college and I don't think she was discriminating, but it's just something that I guess I was instinctively, she saw in me and, and so Maybe I, it was winning the $42. That, that, that may have been it. Maybe she <laughs> said, oh, you're gonna be a trial lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the contingency, and you won again. Um, no, actually, uh, and then we came to California. Now, we made a stop, because it'll tie in with some things I'll talk about a little bit later, but we made one stop in Birmingham, Alabama. My dad got a one-year uh, consulting contract at the Huntsville Space Project. So my sister and I and uh, a younger brother, uh, uh, the, the older, had started moving on from the family um, uh, growing up. Um, I was fourth of six kids, which was kind of nondescript. I was the third boy, fourth child. Somehow I thought I would have gotten lost in the shuffle, but mom hung in there with me. Uh, so we end up in Birmingham, Alabama in, in 1955, and that was uh, the beginning of the civil rights movement and, and, and a culture shock for me. I mean, I'm a Yankee, I guess. And uh, so I walk in there and the idea that they have discrimination on, on buses, discrimination at schools, discrimination uh, on where you drink your water. Uh, it was just like a shock to me. And I never forget my sister and I jumping on the bus to go to the Catholic high school uh, and find out that we ran to the back and we stopped, sat down. And suddenly the bus comes to a screeching halt and this big muscular bus driver comes and walked to the back and said, what are you kids doing? And I said, well, we're always doing what young kids do. We ran to the back of the bus. Well, in this area, this is where the colored sit. And you sit up there with the white people and where you belong. And so we had to be ordered out of the back of the bus to sit in the white portion of the uh, bus. So those kinds of things had a real impact. And, uh, and to see a Catholic uh, high school that was discriminated at that time that they had not even integrated the Catholic schools. So a Catholic black individual could not attend schools 
with a Catholic white individual, and, and it kind of tests your faith a little bit. Uh, but the Catholic Church ultimately took a very progressive uh, viewpoint and segregated their schools even before the public schools, uh, which caused them to lose a few donors, and there's a great story about that too. But in any event, um, then after that year, which was uh, certainly something that was highly uh, educational, uh, we then came to California uh, at the same, I arrived in California, oddly enough, the same time Disneyland arrived into Orange County. And, our so paths, was that 55, our path, 1955? 1955, and our paths ultimately cross, cross yeah, later. Yes, so when, when you sued Disneyland, and we, we may get to that later. So uh, what, what made you decide to go into law? Well, um, first of all, I was very motivated by my parents, and particularly the, the fact that they came out of the Depression, they were New Deal Democrats, and so I had this kind of public service or wanting to do something good and, and stand up against evil and the forces and, and whatever. Uh, so it was kind of part of my personality. Um, and, uh, but ultimately, when I was in school and going through high school, when the arts were still in the schools and I had great art opportunity and we had great theater classes and stage production and all of that, I got very interested in potentially being an actor. I was also always, always fascinated by the law, you know, Perry Mason and all those things that were going on, you know, because it, it, you know, it's, it gets glamorized to a large degree, but it's certainly attractive to a young person who didn't know a lawyer, didn't have a lawyer in the family. All I knew about law was whatever uh, Perry Mason was doing that week. Um, and so I was interested in that, but I thought I was going to go in the direction of, of being an actor. Um, and then I guess there's this pragmatic side of Wiley that said, hey, I'm coming from a relatively poor family. No, none of us have completed college. Um, I did a little research on the statistics as to how many young actors actually succeed and make any money and get beyond waitressing uh, or doing waitress, uh, waiter work or, or et cetera. Uh, and so I decided to take the pragmatic approach. Uh, and when I was at Santa Ana College after doing some plays, I decided I'm going to focus on um, uh, going on to Cal State Fullerton, and then going on to, to, to law school at Marquette. And, and now you're a benefactor of the theater at, at South Coast Repertory and Chance Theater, so you've, you've certainly done that. But let me ask you, um, uh, there's a bit of acting in what you do, isn't there? Being a, being a trial lawyer, there's some, <laughs> there's some performing, there's some acting? Uh, well, I, I like to call it more sophisticatedly, I would like to call it um, communication. <laughs> it gives you communication skills. Uh, acting uh, uh, where someone has a script. The interesting thing about being a, uh, a trial lawyer is that uh, it all, your, your theater background or your, what you learned in stage productions comes into, really comes into play. Because number one, you are kind of the director of the production. Uh, you're the producer. Uh, you actually are the script writer. Uh, the script writer comes from the real stories of your clients and the real tragedies that they've been exposed to or the companies that have been taken over by bad companies. So that, that it gives you the basis of the script, but you actually do the actual screenplay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you end up being one of the lead actors well, and lead communicators. And so that was, it's very exciting. It's very, um, uh, you take on a lot of responsibility. Uh, you have people's lives that come into play uh, that you have to be uh, very concerned about. Um, but certainly, without a doubt, uh, what goes on in terms of learning to communicate and learning to act, uh, Matthew Artkin, who's done a number of plays at South Coast Rep, I'm sure you've met, uh, the reality is that he also gives classes for lawyers uh, that teach them how to communicate and how to take uh, their ideas. So the difference is we deal with real stories, real lives, uh, not written, made up facts, but the facts that are dealt to us and, and unfortunately oftentimes right. tragically dealt to the clients that we represent. And of course the other side has its, uh, has its story, its narrative that it's trying to tell and then the jury decides. That's correct. That's the, okay. It's called the American system. Yeah. Best, the, best system okay. in the world. Let's talk, let's uh, fast forward from your, uh, from uh, moving to California, going to school here, and then, uh, I, is it 1968 you're at the Ambassador Hotel? or was 1968, because I... And you were there, 
Uh, Bobby Kennedy was giving the speech. He was assassinated there. Talk about that. You were there. And so why were you there? And uh, ex explain that tragic incident as you witnessed it. Uh, why I was there was my interest in public policy, my interest in what my parents taught me about the New Deal and about what government can do to help people. And then, of course, I uh, came into Santa Ana College in 1960 when a young gentleman named John Kennedy, a Catholic, uh, running to be the first Catholic president of the United States, uh, w w became someone I looked up as, as a true hero. And so I became involved with politics and democratic politics in 1960 in the John Kennedy campaign. I was in law school when the assassination occurred. We, uh, I, I'm one of those many people who knew exactly where they were and what they were doing. Yeah on that date uh, in 1963. Uh, be, and then after that, I kind of uh, backed away from politics. It's a very uh, you know discouraging event, to put it mildly. And, um, but then Bobby ran for the US Senate. Bobby then came on the scene. I thought he was probably the most spiritual candidate I'd ever seen. Um, I found him to be absolutely passionate and committed to what he cared about and what he cared about in helping race relations, poverty, and all those issues. And so I then volunteered to work in the Bobby Kennedy campaign. And I chaired the Young Lawyers section of the campaign in California. In California. Um, I was with him, uh, and as, as were many others, uh, yeah, at a breakfast uh, at the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, on that date in 1968, he came and stopped by each table thanking all of us for the work we had done in his campaign. He was going to get on a plane and go to Oregon because uh, they were having a primary the same day. And then he was going to fly back to the Ambassador Hotel and uh, what we hope would be, of course, a declaration of, of victory. Uh, and then I think at that point we felt we would march into Chicago and felt fairly confident that the nominee would be Robert Kennedy of the Democratic Party. Um, Betty and I, my wife of uh, 50 plus years, uh, who helped me through law school and lots of other great things, um, we went there. Uh, we were in the very room where the incident took place. Uh, strangely enough, um, the room was so, well, that wouldn't be strange. It was packed and so packed that you could barely move. So at some point, if we wanted to get a breath of fresh air or get a, go to the restroom or whatever it would be, you had to be creative. I figured out how to go into the kitchen, walk through the kitchen, get around this huge crowd that you could not make your way through, and then to uh, be able to take a break and then come back through the kitchen. Uh, that is exactly what happened with uh, Sirhan Sirhan. So we were out, went through the kitchen, came back out into the main room, stood right by the podium about 10 feet away, uh, when Bobby Kennedy stepped to the microphone and uh, declared that he uh, was, of course, the winner. And, when, and the last thing he said, of course, was on to Chicago, step back into the kitchen. Then we heard some uh, pop, 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 sounded more like firecrackers than guns, because you had a huge room, loud noise. Uh, nobody quite could knew what was going on. Um, the kitchen entry was about 10 feet back behind the podium. Um, and, uh, but I knew that's where he had stepped into, and then uh, we could see something had happened. And then, of course, the rumors were flying like crazy. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was shot. No, it was Steve Smith. No, it was Rosa Greer. Uh, he's, he's been killed. No, he's just, you know, nobody knew. So I did one of the more, what my more wise decisions in the course of my life uh, is I said, Betty, let's get out of here. There's nothing we can do. This is not a place we want to be. Let's get outside out of this room and then we'll be able to then truly understand what's going on. We walked out of that room five minutes before it got sealed and no one else was allowed to leave. We go down a corridor uh, and we're heading down this corridor to go out to our car and we look behind us and I see LA police officers running with this very dark, small individual, running down the, and obviously taking this individual out of the hotel. And they were in a full run. And I said, Betty, we got to get out of the way. They're not going to stop for us. And I stepped into a hallway. I barely 
just missed Betty's hand. The police gathered Betty up, went for another 20 or 30 or 40 feet, slightly put her, pushed her aside and went out the door. Uh, and, and that it was, was Sirhan Sirhan the Sirhan. assassin. We, didn't, we had no idea who it was at the time, but wow. in the next morning in the pictures, wow. we were watching Sirhan being run out of the hotel uh, to avoid a Jack Ruby incident or something. Uh, and uh, we got into our cars and then we began to hear wow. what happened. Wow, so two, two assassinations in short order. Short order, and I was a delegate for uh, Bobby Kennedy to Chicago, mm -hmm. but I chose not to, so, to go. So your involvement in, with the Democratic Party goes back to the early 60s? Correct. Okay, and so now... When I was five years old. Right, okay, and you have been involved in uh, judicial selections. Uh, uh, you know, maybe we can get into that in a little more detail. Um, but you've also, you're a strong supporter of Loretta Sanchez, the former congresswoman who was unsuccessful in her run for the U.S. Senate. Um, here in Orange County, uh, Hillary Clinton defeated Donald Trump in Orange County. There's now a lot of enthusiasm among Democrats that they may be able to win one or more congressional seats that have traditionally been held by Republicans. Uh, is Orange County becoming uh, more Democratic, or uh, was this uh, just an anomaly, what happened the, uh, this last well, election? Well, two things are going on. Uh, it's becoming more Democratic, without a doubt, but it's also becoming more independent. Uh, and the, and the, the, the group that is trailing is the Republican Party. Uh, many of the Republicans are moving into the uh, decline to state independent category. Many of them are crossing over and becoming uh, Democrats. Uh, and it, if you look at the demographics and what the whole trend has been, uh, we will be a Democratic county in the not too distant future. Really? Because it looks like the gains, as you say, are uh, independents uh, with some drop off from Republicans, but the Democrats are growing extremely slowly. I mean, it's almost a flat line for well, Democrats. Well, no, they're growing and the Republicans are losing and the independents are moving. It's kind of a way station and they're gonna then move over. Uh, and so I, I, I see, you know, and nobody has the absolute crystal ball, but I expect that this will become a Democratic uh, county. But that, but it'll be slight and it's not gonna be overwhelming. Uh, but, but we're a county that's more responsive now at this point. It's more, we're more open, as I th hope to think I am and other people to, because at one point, if, unless you were a Republican, they, they ran everything. You know, and they voted for Republican, they voted for the yellow dog, they voted for anybody that was running without regard to skill or ability. That, that's changed dramatically. And, and you can see the independence of the voters that actually voted for Hillary Clinton over uh, Trump, is that the guy's name? <laughs> uh, and so you can see how that affects, and that never, going back to 1960, that never would have been uh, thought. Uh, I grew up at a time uh, when people would come to me and whisper, I'm really a Democrat, Wiley. Uh, either I don't want to say because it's not good for my job or my opportunities, uh, but I'm really a Democrat. Uh, or I'm, I'm an independent, but I'm really a Democrat. I just don't want to take that next step. So all the whispers now have turned into real action. It's okay. Yeah. As I tell all my friends in Orange County, it's okay yeah. to be a Democrat. And uh -huh. besides that, it's okay to do what you believe in. This yeah. is not a popularity contest. This is what what is your right. core values and what do you what, what do you really care about? Speaking of uh, speaking of the Aitken family and uh, maybe in our open mic segment that follows this, we can talk about the family business, your law firm. But your daughter Ashley, who is uh, a a, a, a uh, occasional guest uh, on this show. Um, uh, a fellow attorney, she's in your firm. Is she looking at a run for something? Well, I think she is, but doesn't she have her own show now on this uh, this channel? <laughs> yeah, she's working she, on it. She's, she's, uh, yeah. <laughs> she's just merely doing your guest thing, Rick. Um, well, Ashley is a very special lady. Of course, any father is going to say that, but here's a lady who is extremely accomplished, former federal prosecutor, uh, somebody who had worked in... Uh, uh, politics, somebody who was actually working with the Gephardt staff when the president of the United States was impeached. And, and uh, only because we're running short on time, I, I, I want to cut to the quick here. So uh, we, we know she's terrific. I would second everything you said. But uh, is, is she looking at running for, uh, uh, I understand she, she is the Aiken who both, I think, uh, is like her father. Uh, who is really interested in public policy issues. Uh, she has been approached uh, 
to run for district attorney uh, by numerous people. Uh, but I think her real focus at this point is, is that uh, she's a proud citizen of Anaheim. Uh, she has been very involved in Anaheim City uh, issues, and uh, she'll be shortly opening up a committee to run for the mayor of uh, Anaheim. Well, Wiley, what a great way to end show number 500 with a little news on Ashley. That, that's <laughs> exciting. Thank you very much. And, and now we'll stick around. We, we've got a lot more to talk about, so, and we'll continue this discussion. That's it for now. Thanks again to my guest, Wiley Aiken. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbssocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live. They are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University in the City of Orange. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming.